Hello, everybody, and welcome to Book Club. So my name is Julie Fafan Balzer, and I'm so glad that you are here. Um, so just a couple quick things before we get started. Um, I always see from the banner down below, I do have a new online art journaling class. Um, it's called 10 minutes a day for 30 days. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. The idea, the premise is that you want to get into an art journaling habit. And so you art journal for basically just 10 minutes every day. Uh, so I'm having the craziest internet issues lately, so I apologize if things are a little bit weird today. Okay, so let's get started. The book that we are reading is called uh, A World of Artist Journal Pages, and um, it's basically curated by Don DeVry's Sokol. So it's curated because it's lots of different people. Okay, I have an alarm going off that won't go off, so I'm very sorry, but hold on a second. I'm back. This is one. This is one of those how many technical problems can you have kind of days. But I want to say hi Sue, hi Gail, hi Sophia, hi Donna, hi Katie, hi Carolyn. I'm so glad that you all could make it and we can hang out together. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in to the book. So the first thing I want to say is that this book has no instructions, right? And um, even if you look at the very first page. I don't think, maybe it's not the very first page, but it's, it's pretty close to the very first page. It says right here, um, there's a bold print. Let me make this a little bit bigger so that you can see it. Uh, it says right here in bold print, please keep in mind, this book isn't meant to be a how-to guide, but a gallery, a showcase of art journal pages that may jumpstart your own creativity, okay? And what I am here to tell you is I disagree. I disagree completely. So even though the book is basically just, um, well, you can see the format right here. It's pages. Then most of the text says the name of the person, their occupation, um, a website if they have one, and then the materials that they used. There are a couple of interviews, like here's an example of one. Um, with the artists where they ask them, you know, like what advice would you give someone, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some opportunities for you to get something that's a little bit more like instruction, but I also do have a plan for how you can get kind of some more direct inspiration. Okay. So I'm going to show you that and welcome to everybody else who just popped in Liliana and Katie and April. Uh, and Gail, so nice to see you all. Uh, and Katie, thank you for asking. Uh, my husband and my son had COVID this last week. I escaped because I was in LA when they got sick. And I found out when I was on the plane that they both tested positive. So it was a little bit crazy, but uh, they are both better and negative and returned to health, which is fantastic. Um, Gail's also struggling with some internet issues. Um, I heard that there was a huge Xfinity outage. So I don't know, Gail, if you're caught up in that, but that's part of what happened to us. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and I'll show you the kind of rubric that I'm using. So I have entitled this presentation, How I Make Coffee Table Art Books Useful. And what I mean by a coffee table art book is any book that basically is like filled with pretty pictures, but it's not like a DIY how-to instruction. So like you could pick up a book in a museum gift shop of Degas or Mary Cassatt or whoever it is that you love and basically use this strategy to be able to um, get something out of it, to be able to basically make it, turn it into instructions, okay? Uh, and by the way, if you like this way of thinking and all this kind of stuff, this is what I do in my membership program. Um, and it's also what I do in all of my classes and all that stuff. So I hope you will check that out. Okay. So how I make coffee art table, uh, coffee table art books useful. It's a very, very simple process, right? I make four kinds of lists. 
So the first kind of list is things to look up. The second kind of list is quotes. And the third is ideas to try. And the fourth is observations and questions. Now, as far as how this works, sometimes I'm feeling lazy and I just do tabs. Because tabs say to me, we'll just come back to this. So I sort of like cruise through the book, tab whatever interests me, and then I come back and I see which list the tab belongs on. And then I write that down in my notebook. I have a fairly robust bullet journal. I did a long series on my blog about commonplace books and bullet journals and art journals and sketchbooks and student notebooks and sort of like where they all overlap. And I think in the end, like I'm a notebooker and I don't think it matters what you call it, right? So now I'm going to take you through kind of how I used each of these lists to approach this particular book. You don't have to do it the same way. And that's something that I always say, and it's so important to say, and I'm just going to make my face huge and say it a million times. Just because I do something one way doesn't mean that you have to do it. I always share the methods and ideas that work for me because that's what works for me. But we're all different and you have to know that you should do whatever's going to work for you. Okay. So let's add this back in and let's us go ahead and take a look at the first bit here. Okay, so the first thing that I looked up is a lot of people mentioned books. Like I said in the book, this is like books on books, but there are some interviews in this book. And one of the things, one of the questions that got asked a lot in these interviews that are here um, was who are artists that you find inspiring, right? I'm trying to find one where that question was more, is more obviously asked. There you go. Maybe, uh, you know, who are artists? Yeah. Which artists do you look to for inspiration? And so one of the things that people often said is they mentioned books in that along with artists names. So this is just one random book that I grabbed. I actually tabbed a bunch of different books that I wanted to look up, but living the creative life by, uh, Rice Freeman Zachary. So I looked it up on Amazon. Here it is, Living the Creative Life. Uh, and the description from the publisher says, creativity is different for everyone. And these artists share their insights on the muse, if you believe in her, keeping a sketchbook or not, and prioritizing your art, whether you aspire to create solely for your own pleasure or becoming a full-time artist. It's got a lot of, um, I think, four-star and five-star reviews, and it had a good score on Goodreads. So that might be something that I add to my wish list or my cart. And it's a good way to kind of get a sense also whether, like, if you like someone's art, you might like the books that they like too. So there, I have a list of probably like 10 books that I pulled out of this book to take a peek at. The other thing that I like to look up is people referenced. So there were a lot of artists referenced that I knew. Some are contemporary artists and some are artists that are long gone. Um, so this artist that I've written here, Hannah Lore Baron, and I think I'm saying that correctly. She's German, so I'm not totally sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I think it's Hannah Lore Baron. I looked her up. I found her official website from her estate. Um, and it was a really interesting deep dive into a woman artist that I didn't know a lot about. So this is only part of her bio, but I thought it was really compelling. So I thought I would read it to you. It says, Hannah Lord Barron practiced an art of concealment and protection. Out of rough and common materials, she fashioned constructions, drawings, and collages that transmuted the painful experiences of her life into indelible images of the darkness and mystery of being. Baron was born Hannelore Alexander in Diligen, a small town in the Saar region of Germany in 1926. Her father, Julius, was a Jewish textile merchant. You can already tell where the story is going. And almost as soon as Hitler came to power, the family began to feel the ominous consequences. Hannelore and her brother were sent to a special school for Jews only on, um, pardon my uh, pronunciation, on Kristallnacht. The family's apartment was ransacked and her father beaten. Thus began a period of flight and border crossing that did not end until the family managed to emigrate from Lisbon to New York in 1941. In the midst of all of this, one of Barron's most vivid memories was that of a brief family's wrecked apartment where the bloody handprints of her father were still visible on the walls. Here is a look at some of her artwork. Uh, I believe the earliest work is from 1969. And then on the next slide, I think I have something from the 1980s. So she definitely made work for several decades. And it was interesting, obviously, to see a reference uh, of an artist that I was not familiar with. And one of the things that I appreciate so much. So for instance, this artist here um, that I'm looking at right now, let me take the slides out for a second. Um, she's from Russia. 
And so I'm not sure that I necessarily would have found a lot of artists um, from other countries. It tends to be easier to find artists in your own region and your own country who speak the same language as you. So it's really nice that there are so many international artists featured. This is one from New Zealand. And again, like I love finding about, you know, what are their reference points? Who are the touchstones that these other artists are going to? So that part was really interesting to me. And I've got a, I've got actually a long list of names of both contemporary um, and uh, artists from the past who people are influenced by and liked. And then as a completely egotistical side note, I just have to mention and thank somebody mentioned my name in this book as an influence. And I appreciated that too. Uh, okay. So let's head down this next slide. So another thing to look up is the contributors. There were a bunch of people in here I thought were super talented who I wasn't familiar with their work. And so I decided to start looking them up. And the first was a woman named Natalie Nair. And so I went looking online for her and I went to her website first, which was provided in the book. It hadn't been updated since 2018 and there were no social links on it. So then I went full on internet sleuth. <laughs> sleuth stalker something like that and i was like i have to find this woman i like her work so much and you know she hasn't updated her blog so i i managed to find her instagram which was hard because her profile photo is actually the back of her head but i matched the photo of her and her grid to the photo of her and her website and i was like this has got to be her great so i pressed the follow button and then i moved on to the next artist so then I looked up this artist, Charlotte Harms. I really liked hers, but then I looked at her blog and I was like, that's weird. It was updated in 2016 last with the book announcement. That photo is of her holding this book, right? Saying that her work was published in a book. The previous post that was 2013 and there were no social links and no amount of internet sleuthing could I find Charlotte Harms artist anywhere even though her profession in the book is listed as artist. And I thought if she's a professional artist, she must have a website, a socialist, something, right? Couldn't find anything. So then I thought, I've clearly made a mistake. I thought that this was a fairly new book and it obviously isn't, right? So I had to look up when was this book published? And it, it, was, it was everywhere and obvious. I just, for some reason, when I saw it on Amazon, I was like, oh, this looks like a great book and I've never heard of it. It must be new, which is ridiculous. But it was published in 2015, which, as I say in the next slide, I started to think and I realized, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense because there were a bunch of artists who I saw in the book whose work I liked, uh, who like I follow on Instagram, but then I saw their work in the book and I was like, this doesn't look like their work at all. And I realized that for this book to have been published in 2015, right? It means that the work has to have been from 2012, 2013, maybe 2004. Like, you know what I mean? Like, cause it, cause Don DeVry Sokol would have had to make a call for art probably, I mean, book publishing is usually at least a year, sometimes longer. She would have had to make a call for art probably six months to a year easily before that, because then she would have had to. Anyway, I figured that everything in this book has to be 10 years old, which also started to make sense because all of the books that were being referred to, I was like, oh, this is an old book. Oh, I think I have this book. This is an old book. <sighs> but I figured it out. I finally figured it out. Yes, the book is old, but there's still lots of great content, right? Okay, so let's figure out. So the next rabbit hole I went down, I actually think was probably one of the most interesting rabbit holes, at least to me, which is, uh, but just, I put these in for reference. So this is my art journal 10 years ago on the left and my art journal. These are some pages I made for the class that I'm teaching right now on the right, right? Right. Similar subject, similar sort of bl dark blue kind of color theme with a little bit of pink, right? But, and it's not that one is bad. It's just that it's different. I've changed. And the same thing is true here. I tried to pick again, similar color scheme, right? There is the blue and the yellow. And that's what I was doing in, in 2013 in my art journal. And then on the right is what I'm doing now in 2023 in the class that I'm teaching, right? So it makes sense that all of these other artists have changed. So I went sleuthing because I'm, I might be a stalker. I love Ardeth Goodwin. She's one of my favorite artists. I think her work is amazing. 
colorful, patterned, expressive, interesting, unique, like so many wonderful things. And these are some pieces that I stole off of her Instagram page. Um, and then, but in the book, when I saw her work, I was like, I love artists and I love these pages, but this doesn't look like her work. And now I understand it's because it's from her 10 years ago. So let's take a look at Art of Goodwin 10 years ago. I think she's super duper talented. Can I make this bigger? Why does this not want to be? There we go. Okay, so here you go. So this is Art of Goodwin 10 years ago. And you can see all the seeds do you know what I mean? Of who she became. She obviously liked tons and tons and tons of color and pattern. But look at that face, the simplicity of it, as opposed to the incredibly colorful, um, detailed, intricate faces she's doing now. And this is some more of her work here, which again, is beautiful and exciting and interesting. And I like it. But this is who she was as an artist 10 years ago. And just for reference again, this is, well, like this, there you go. For reference again, this is her work now, right? Really has evolved and changed. So I I did this with a lot of artists, but I'm just going to show you three because otherwise it gets excessive. So <laughs> let's see. So the next one is, this is an artist that I love named Massimo Noda. He goes by Noda Max online. And you can see that I indicated that his work is on page 100. And when I saw the um, page of his work, I was like, really? This is what he picked to send in? But of course, it's work from 10 years ago. So I think his work, whenever I see it on Instagram, it stands out to me because it's graphic, it's bold. He uses a ton of black and white, usually with just like a little splash of color. He sort of integrates um, photos and some interesting stuff. It just, it always makes me, I like the way he uses text. I just, I kind of always want to make things when I see his work. And those are the kind of people that I like to follow on social because they make me excited about making things. Now, my work doesn't look anything like his, but he just, he makes me happy. So uh, now with his page in the book here, if you look at it, oops, nope, this way, do -si do um, this is it. These are pages from, again, I think these are really interesting. I think these are kind of, you know, quirky and fun. And I can see that that idea of like primarily black and white with a splash of color was there 10 years ago. Certainly his use of text, all sorts of stuff, but they're very different than what he's doing now. And I love this idea that our art journals exist as this way of like seeing how we've changed as artists, seeing how our interests have changed, learning, you know, who we are differently. Okay, so let's do one more. Cause I could do this all day long. Uh, so this is a woman named Marianne Moss, whose handle on Instagram is Dispatch from LA. That should have been another clue, by the way, for me, that this book is old because I, um, all, there's no Instagram handles. Everybody, it's their websites, right? And their blogs and stuff like that. And there are a lot of dot blogs, but I, I should have figured it out. Anyway, Marianne Moss, super talented, love her work. She does these great drawings. This is some of her work now contemporaneously. And then she's on 278. So, um, when I came across her work, I was like, oh yeah, Marianne Moss, I haven't seen work like this from you in a long time on your Instagram. Duh, 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 duh. Uh, so here it is. Her work is beautiful now, beautiful then. Check it out. So I think like her drawing style is still very much the same, but I think the biggest difference when I sat down to analyze it is that she was much more wedded to filling the whole page and having kind of a grid going on in a lot of these, as opposed to, I think it's a little bit, um, I don't know if looser is the right word, something like that. Um, but it's just, it's less like needing to be held in that kind of grid, which I thought was really interesting, but still very much the same artist, which is always exciting to me, right? Okay, so those are just some various things that I like to look up. That's my look up list. You guys, we've only we're only on number one of the what to do. Uh, okay, so let's get moving. So number two is quotes. So I just, as I'm going through like the interviews or sometimes if there's a book that has like a bio of the artist or something like that, I just like to pull interesting quotes, okay? 
So, a, and again, this is not a complete list, but a couple of the things that I pulled were just even like, I liked the way that Jeanette House said, play unselfconsciously. It's not that this is like, uh, I'm trying to think about it. It's not that this is like the most brilliant things that you've ever heard, but it's things you want to remember, ideas, sound bites that you think will be useful to you and make you, um, you know, have a memory of what you read, what the essence of the book was. Um, I liked this idea from B, I think it's Mahan, Mahan. She said, working with paper is celebrating its simple existence. It's everywhere and we hardly notice it because I've never thought about paper like that. So that was like, kind of mind blowing, right? Um, anyway, so it just gave me a little sense of the personality of it. And I've, I've been talking a lot about this um idea of like doing the work. And so I ended up pulling a number of quotes too that were about like just doing the work. Like you don't build a body of work without doing the work first. Natasha said that it's fine to learn from others and take workshops to learn techniques. But if you really want to create, you have to spend the time creating. And I, and I think that's so true. I know at least for my own journey in art, the act of daily creating, this is part of where the 10 minute idea came, which is something that I've been doing, um, for 13, 14, 15 years, something like that. Um, and it's because there is something that is very useful in growing yourself to make art every day, or if not every day, Monday through Friday, or if not every day, like on a regular schedule, because that changes something in your brain so that you're thinking sort of in an art way, so that you're more um, involved in sort of long-term projects opposed to everything being a short-term project. And so I really... Um, I really think like, you know, you got to put in the work to figure it all out. That's kind of where that all comes from. Okay. So next up is I made a list of ideas to try. And this is just like a sketchy list of like, let's say I love a page, right? Uh, and so I'm flipping through right? Just flipping through and I'm like, Ooh, you know, I love how sketchy this is. I love how soft it is. You know, and uh, where else did I put a tab? Ooh, look, you know, I love how like there's the text and the drawing and like it's mixing, you know, found objects with art objects. And, you know, I want to try that or, you know, I look here and I go, oh, this is part of my interest in minimal pages. Like, I don't know that I personally could ever leave the entire side of a page blank. That's really hard for me, but I find it really interesting to see other people doing it. Um... Let's see. Um, here, Orly Avenieri, who I think is so talented. I have her book too, and I love her work. You know, again, these deeply saturated colors. And so as I went through, I just made a list for myself. Like, what are some things that I'm interested in trying right now? I want to, it's like a to-do list for myself so that the next time I go in the studio and I'm bored or I'm not sure what to do, or I, um, you know, I'm looking for a little bit of guidance. I have a list that's guided by me. I want to try some minimalist pages. I want to do big, bold text, especially stamped or stenciled, more drawing on top of book pages. And I said more because the example on the right is uh, a piece that I did for um, my sketchbook class. Um, and I, I, it was kind of a one-off. I don't do a ton of that. And I feel like I need to do more of it. Uh, I want to do more text maps, more non sequiturs. I want to do a grid of colored dots. I want to do more line uh, and drawing and, you know, and there's just like a lot more ideas like that. I just kept writing. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? What does this excite me to do? What does it inspire me to do so that I have a to-do list? By the way, the grid of dots that I was talking about, I just think this is really cute. Um, I saw this page right here. And this is not like my style at all, but you know what? I love this grid of dots. And I thought, how can I make this grid of dots my own? And that's actually, if you're going to play along today, when we go into the little art lesson part of it, we're going to be making our own version of a grid of dots. So that's what we're going to be doing. Okay. So those are things I want to do. Then I have a list of observations and questions like how have the artists I love now changed? How have they stayed the same? What do the pages I love have in common? Which pages do I like to look at versus which pages do I want to make? That's so important. That actually, I had a student recently in a class who was like, you know what I realized is I like looking at those, but I don't want to do those. Great realization, right? Really important to know that about yourself. 
Um, there are a number of artists who make pages in very different styles. You know, you don't have to be consistent. I was reminded that when you're looking at like two or three pages by the same artist and you're like, oh, I'm surprised that these are by the same person. Um, I also think be yourself is a huge takeaway for me. I saw a lot of work in this book that felt kind of dupl duplicative and derivative, meaning I was like, oh, that looks like so-and-so's work or, oh, they're all doing these faces the same way or, oh, you know what I mean? And I was like, that just... It may be pretty, but it doesn't feel exciting. It doesn't feel fresh. So it was just a reminder, be yourself, you know? Um, I have just this question, which is an eternal question. What's the difference between an art journal and a sketchbook? You know, there's definitely some pages in here that I would have termed more sort of what I think of as a sketchbook. Oh, by the way, I just have to show these pages because I love her work so much. Um, why won't you? There you go. Uh, these minimalist pages are, so, I just think they're so cool and interesting. I love them. I heart them with big hearts and like puffy stars and lots of other things like that. Okay. So, uh, I want the slideshow to be big. There we go. Um, then, uh, so many artists about talk about going for a walk or moving their bodies when they're blocked. So it's just a good reminder that works for me, but I wanted to really remember that. Um, and then just a, a note to myself that I am drawn to deeply saturated pages, both deeply saturated in color and pages, um, saturated or packed with images and words. And this is just now, I don't have to read, read this book a thousand times. I can look at my list of references. I can look at my list of quotes. I can look at my observations and questions and I can basically remember the book. And if I need to reference any of it, I can certainly pull it out of the shelf, shelf to do so. But I also could do this with library books. So I don't have to own every incredibly expensive, you know, coffee table art book. I can just go to the library do this process with my lists, you know, and then have a really nice comprehensive sense of it. So I've just written this again here for you. Um, if you want to like bookmark the video or whatever, this is where you want to come back to, right? You want to make four lists, things to look up, quotes, ideas to try, observations and questions. They don't have to be in that order. Those are the lists that have worked for me for years. And it's how I take apart a lot of books. Um, so it's also how I take apart a lot of like classes and other things in life as well. Um, and then this is what we're going to make today. And so these are the things you're going to need. You're going to need an art journal. You're going to need collage paper and glue. You're going to need acrylic paint. I'm going to be using golden so flat matte acrylic paints. If you don't know this already, matte acrylic paints don't um, stick when you close the journal. So that's why I like to use the matte paints as opposed to gloss. And so the so flat matte acrylics are super matte. So that works out every time. I used to just mix gesso in with all my paints to try to keep that matte thing happening. Um, but this is a better solution. This is a better mousetrap. That way I don't have to tint everything, you know? Um, and then you want any favorite pens and pencils you have. So take a moment to gather your stuff. I'm going to take a peek into the comments to see what everybody is saying. Um, the Maria Tellier says she loves the suggestion of pulling quotes. She's going to start that. That's great. Katie says it's a very useful list. That's great. Good list. I'm glad that you guys like it. Okay. So let's get started with our piece. Oh, I just wanted to mention next book club before I forget. Um, so the next book club is on October 18th at 12.15. The book is going to be this one, uh, another random buy off of Amazon, Beginner's Guide to Abstract Art by Laura Ryder. I don't know her at all, but the reviews on the book were good. So, and it was like $10 or something, $11. So I was like, let's get it and see, right? What's the worst that could happen? Um, and so today for my, oh, so let's just look one more time at the, at our inspiration piece and sort of think about what we're doing here. So should I lower this a little bit? Should I have lowered this before? Okay, there you go. So this is our inspiration piece. It's pretty simple. And I'm thinking basically about what I like about this. I mean, I do think it's funny, like the dots here and the dots here, but that feels a little bit too much like direct copying for me. So instead, I'm just thinking, I just like a grid of dots. Like, I think that's a cool... 
I think that's a cool idea to have a grid of dots. These aren't my kind of dots, but I can make that happen. So I'm going to do a grid. Just That's all I'm taking away is a grid of dots. So this is my art journal. Um, and again, this is the journal that I'm using for um, my class. You can see some of the classwork pages in here. And what, this is kind of a grid of dots, actually, now that I look at it. Um, but what I'm looking for is a page that can kind of take a grid of dots. Like some of these are just too busy, right? I mean, I suppose you could put a grid of dots in here. There's kind of already a dot started, but it's not what I was kind of imagining in my mind. So um, you could also start with a blank page. I just don't think, ooh, this could be nice. I just don't think I have a, ooh, this could be nice too. Hmm, I don't think that could take a grid of dots. Ooh, a black page could be cool. What do I want to do? Finding the right background. This actually could be interesting for a grid of dots. This already has some dots. Ooh, this could be really nice, but then it has, but it's, I don't know, the background's really aggressive. Okay, I'm feeling like, what do you think? Green lines, green. Let's go with the green, just because it's such a fun color. Okay, so I have my journal. I have this. I have a big tub of collage paper here. Okay. I don't want to make all my dots out of collage paper, but I do want to make some of them out of collage paper. So I think I might as well just start with a kind of a basic, a basic black. So the question is how big should they be? That is the first problem. I think I could probably fit, I could either go super big and do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a very small amount of dots, or I could probably get three rows of three on each page. Let's, let's test some out for size. So let's see, one, two. And of course, I'm going to do these as kind of wonky dots because I'm a wonky dot kind of gal. And then one of the things I do sometimes when my collage paper isn't quite big enough is I'll take a piece of washi tape or something else similar and I will put it off the back. So now I'm turning these two pieces of paper into one piece. This is such a like scrap hoarder thing to do. Like just throw the paper away, Julie. You do not need to hoard your tiny minuscule little scraps. But I do because I love them all so much. Okay, so now I'm just going to cut around here. There you go. And I think these are probably about the right size. So that's a good sort of first jump in. So then I just need to figure out what other scraps I have. And I have a question in my brain, which is, am I really going to make just make this all dots? That is a good question. Or could I make some of them the empty dot? The other thing is like, this is not great color contrast. So I think this is where the paint is going to come in. Let's see. I find this um, yellow, a bit of sort of yellow or gold on this paper, right? That I just cut away kind of intriguing. So maybe this could be a better, starting with this green background, you do have to kind of think about that. So let's see. Tic-tac-toe. I think that's kind of fine. Nothing exciting. Let's see what happens if we get into some, maybe some, this is, a, is that two like dots on dots? Well, you're not even going to see almost any of this once I cut this out because the size is wrong. The size is wrong. Hmm. What if I collage this on here? See how this is morphing? This is what happens to me all the time. What if I collage this on here as kind of like the beginning of some dots? You know what? Let's not talk about it. Let's do it. So I am using a matte gel medium to attach my paper. And I am using, this is a Catalyst Polytip brush. It's my favorite glue brush on earth because it takes a beaten 
and it comes right back. And then the other thing is I'm going to throw a piece of jelly paper under here to protect what's underneath. And then I'm going to apply my glue onto my collage paper. And I don't care if I get it also onto the book. So I'm going right off the edges because I want that paper to go all the way to the edges. And then I'm also going to apply glue on top here. So collage is not just about attaching the paper underneath. You're kind of sealing it between two layers. It's like you're making a sandwich and the collage paper is the meat or the vegetable or whatever it is, the egg salad inside. Okay. And now I, that way I have no wrinkles in this at all. Everything is sealed. And this is kind of an interesting beginning, an unexpected beginning, shall we say. I'm going to put this next piece down here. And because this is kind of fussy, I'm going to put the glue directly onto the art journal and then keep going. So you should play around with what you want to do to get your circles going. Now the question is, do I want to finish the circle? Well, I did say I, we should have some favorite pens and pencils. What do I want to use? This is a good standby. This is a Posca um, pen. It's a paint pen. So shake, 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 shake. And then the only thing is if there's glue there, nope. I, you never want to put your Posca marker into glue. So let me grab a pencil, which I'm less concerned about. There you go. So here's just a regular color pencil, a brown one. And I'm just going to finish off that circle there. I think I might come in here with some paint to finish off this circle, but let's make it a fun color. Let's make, instead of white, let's make it a fun color. So this is Napthal pink. Okay. Um, and I'm going to stir this paint. The instructions, by the way, do say on here, stir thoroughly. So I'm just going to use my favorite stirring tool, otherwise known as a barbecue skewer. I always buy these when they are um, on sale at the supermarket because they're great paint stirrers. And when you can get a whole bag for like 99 cents, it's amazing. What a good art tool. I asked recently on my Facebook page, what's a totally underrated art tool? And I th feel like skewers could be on the list. Okay, I'm not sure I even need to take anything out of the jar because I suspect that I have enough paint on this skewer to go ahead and just, oh yeah, get right in there. Uh, I also realized that probably my face is less interesting than what's happening with my hands. So let's just Make that a little bit bigger and that a little bit smaller. So this is going to go on and be shiny when it's wet. But as soon as it dries, it'll be nice and matte. So now I am going to need a little bit of paint here to just go like this. And this is how I start to combine, you know, paint and collage and sort of mix it all together. So I really like this color. I feel like I want to spread it around a little bit. So maybe in a couple of the places where I felt like, remember I said I felt like this purple didn't necessarily stand out and this one too in the middle. Uh, is it too matchy matchy to have these? Is it too matchy matchy to have these two circles next to each other? Well, you never know until you find out. The answer is no, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. And then maybe I will create like a little square for one of these circles to sit on, almost as if it were cut out of the paper. And here's actually another way that I can use my skewer because I can just add a little texture by scraping in here just like so. Okay. So then I'm going to clean my brush off just on this paper here. And that becomes another piece of collage paper and pop this brush into water. Okay, let's continue the glue fest here. So we'll throw this one down here, seal it in. Let's see, this big square 
and go here. Oops, looks like there was a little bit of pink kicking around and now I got some pink happening. A happy accident, let's call it. A, a there are no mistakes, only creative opportunities. What an incredible opportunity for me. I just have to figure out what I'm going to do with that opportunity. I'm going to lean into it. Lean into the mistake. Okay. And this is this circle that we cut out of here. And one of the things I like is spreading around the same, just like this pink, spreading it around, spreading around this sort of black and white paper, right, to other areas. Ooh, now my brush has pink in it. So now everything's getting a little bit of, everything's getting a little bit of pink, whether it wants to or not. Okay, so a baby wipe can hopefully solve that problem. I can see the pink in my brush. I'm trying not to put the brush into water, A, because it's covered in glue, but B, because then the water just, the uh, brush just gets super waterlogged. And let's put some of these black, these black, black, black buttons down. So I believe my son made this black collage paper for me. He's very good. This is our hybrid Frankenstein one. You can sort of see it right there. You can barely see the seam, right? It's only because there's that color difference. Um, but that's fun because now it has a direction. So, right, it's very different if I turn that seam sideways. Let's turn that seam sideways as opposed to up and down. And then let's get another dark one right there. Okay, so now we need some more circles. And again, I can paint them, I can collage them, I can do some kind of mixture of it all. Uh, what kind of, what, you know, this is kind of fun. So this is actually from my scrap bin. This is painted vinyl. This is uh, something from Scan and Cut Club where I was showing people how to paint vinyl. But what that means is this is a sticker. So if I cut a circle out of this, it has some cutouts out of it already, so this might be weird, but it's going to be a big old sticker. Maybe I can get it off the backing. Maybe I can do it. Yes, I can. The other day I told my son that he had to sing if he wanted. <laughs> if he, I think I can't remember what treat he wanted. Uh, it's, it seems like a very normal thing in our house to do. Okay, so there is that kind of vinyl circle with the bit cut off. Let's see if we can't get another circle out of it. Circle, 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 circle. And again, this has some more stuff stuck out of it, so it's not going to come out looking very circle. But that's okay. I know how to fix that. Paint will fix a multitude of sins. What do you think? I feel like there's enough for us to do at least one more weird circle. At least one more weird circle. Let's do another circle. And then I will feel like I used up this vinyl, which feels great. Okay, since I went to all the trouble of painting it. Boop, boop, boop. One more, one more. Too many, too few, too next to each other, too far away. Decisions, decisions. Okay, how about here? Ooh, put it down, Funky. Try that again. The inside of the U. There we go. Big sticker. Okay, so now I'm thinking maybe I should get a paint that kind of goes with it. So how about some yellow oxide? So because the paint on this end of the stick might still be wet, the stick has two sides. I will now use the other side. Okay, and again, I will first try to paint off of the stick. Actually, let's leave that in there while I dry out my brush, which is in a jar of water. I'm just rinsing it out. Try to get it dryish, cleanish, something like that. And now let's bring in this yellow ochre. Although I'm not sure how much I need to do with it. I don't want to make these two kind of like their weird 
their weird wonkiness. I'm into it. I'm into the weird wonkiness. You just give them an outline. I find a lot of answers while experimenting. One of the things that I take away from the book and that, I mean, is just generally a thought I have about art journaling is that the more you let go of the idea. Okay, so this is, if I have one quibble with this book, besides the fact that it's 10 years old, um, which is not its fault, it's my fault for not realizing that. Um, it's that I feel like this presents art journals as finished artwork a little bit more than I would, than I feel comfortable with is I guess what I would say. I really think that I was guilty of that for many years of presenting art journals like they were finished artwork when really they should be places I think for exploration. But again, like this is where everybody's different. Maybe you're, you art journal and that is your art. And I think that's fine if that's the case. But for me, I need to get out of the mindset that an art journal is a place for finished work. And I need to get into the mindset that it's a place to um, explore and play and not worry about sort of consequences. So just for fun, I've been splashing this yellow around. Um, let's do... Let's just do some dashes because I feel like it and see, let's actually, let's mix in some pink. Maybe that'll go orangish. No, I didn't even mix it enough for it to really, but just giving something different on the page. I think I need that difference. And in fact, I'm not totally loving the rigidity of the rose. So I might just break them up a little bit. You know, you can start with one idea and sort of meld into something else or not. I'm not sure where this is going to go quite yet. Okay. Cleaning off my brush, cleaning off my brush, cleaning off my brush, putting it in water. Let's get a little more collage going. I feel like some more black and white would really be helpful here. So let's get a little bit of my painted cursive paper going maybe right there. Catalyst brush to the rescue. Boom, 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 boom. So I use a wide variety of papers for collage. That's the way I like it. I don't like having just like, I know some people are dedicated to one type. I am, I am not like that. Here are some more black and white papers that might have some, mm, this one with the lines could be cool because there are now lines. Let's see. Just thinking about how to cut this. That may not have been the best way to cut it, but you know what? It's done. Okay. Should this go here? Yeah. Why not? So I'm worried that this paint is a little bit wet. So I'm going to try to apply the adhesive onto the circle and it's not bad. It's not bad. Okay. Well, she said as she painted pink on top of it, it was a little bit bad, not super bad. Okay. There's some of that pink paint off there. Uh, so there's one more circle spot, although I might put collage circles on top of those dots and see what that does. I might finish off. Is this dry? Cause now I could get my black marker out and just finish this circle. Now, again, I don't want to ruin my tip. That's why you want things to be dry. This paint marker will not be happy if it went into glue. It'll be ruined. And then you will have had, then, you know, this is like a $5 marker. So you'll be sad or I would be sad. It's maybe another better way to put it. Okay. What goes here? How about a messy sloppy? How about a messy sloppy circle? Give me this deli paper, please. I need it for the other side. Okay. So how about a messy sloppy circle? Is this dry? Yes, dry enough. That goes right here and kind of does its own thing, right? And you can see I had the paper under there because it was going that way. Now, what kind of collage can we stick on here? Should I stick collage on here? I have so many questions. Using your heat gun can be a great way to think. Let me look at the comments while I'm drawing this to see what you guys are saying. 
Um, Katie says your pages are scrumptious. Thank you so much. Uh, could punch dots from painty paper. I will do that. That is a good idea too. And yeah, I'm all about process. If you uh, are a member, you know that. If you take any of my classes, you know that. Certainly my new Archerling class is all about process. I find that the older I get, I've been talking a lot about getting older, which is funny because my birthday is not till January. Maybe I just feel old right now. But uh, the more mature I get, uh, the more that I'm, what I'm interested in is process. What I want to hear other artists talk about is process. What I find compelling is process. What, you know, is necessary to my furthering my skills to the next level is process. So I think that's why I used to teach a ton of like techniques, 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 techniques. And I still do. I still love techniques. I still geek out over techniques. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it's the process that really um, allows you to set yourself apart as an artist, that really allows you to feel confident about your work, that really, you know, all those things, all the good things. Okay, so I just grabbed some gesso because I want to add a little bit of white in here. And I figured one of the easiest ways to do that was going to be with some gesso. Interestingly, I didn't buy any white high flow. I mean, high flow. So flat. Because I was like, I have gesso. Why do I need so flat? Although they are different, I suppose. But, you know, I got a big thing of gesso. Okay. So I am going to, I think, paint in this white here, sort of inside this black outline to kind of give it some of the feeling that these pieces have that are on a white piece of paper, even though that's a very light area. And then I feel like this circle is really disappearing. So I'm going to give it an outline. I like that. And then I think I'm going to go and paint a circle on here. See how I feel about that for a minute. So I'm going to take a step back. I don't love it. Is it the size? I don't know. It's not quite right. I'm going to think about it for a minute. I'm going to just fix. This had kind of a really nice white edge that I messed up with my little stripes and I missed that white edge. So I'm putting that back in. Um, I think I don't like this white on here. Let's see if this paint is dry enough for me to. It is. Great. The paint underneath was dry enough that I can just wipe it off. Paint is flexible and easygoing. Uh, I think... I want something inside this circle. So what do I want? What do I want? Maybe some blue or some green would be really nice. I should close some of my paints because I'm legendary for leaving them open and letting them all dry out. Okay. So let's see. How about, mm, this is a really nice green. This is called dark green. Looks very much like chromium green. And just for the sake of speed, I'm not going to stir it. I'm going to shake it. And then I'm going to not be able to open it. Ah, there you go. There you go. Here you go. Okay. Open it up. Uh, Raquel says, I like that you're talking about your thought process. Hi, Raquel. I always talk about my thought process. That's one of the things that I always do as a teacher. All of my classes are like that. My current art journaling class, you cannot get me to shut up about my thoughts. Um, and this is the kind that what we're doing right now, this page is very much what we do every month in membership where we just sort of play, talk about process. I talk through my thought process, you know, let you know sort of why I'm making the choices that I'm making. Because again, I think that's the most helpful thing. This page feels kind of done. It just suddenly came together just like that. Just like with the addition of that green. It just makes me feel like it's done. I don't know. Maybe right here there's something going on. I'm just not sure if the green is the right color to. Well, you know what? The green is the color that we have. So the green is the color that's happening skinny circle instead of the fat outlines I've been doing. I do like that. 
Okay. Guess what, guys? Here is the grid of circles that was inspired by that page in this uh, World of Artist Journals book. Um, it's nothing like the grid that's in that book, but it's absolutely super fun and was a really great sort of experiment to try, right? So I would say like my final feelings about this book uh, are that, listen, I think it's super fun. It's a great book. It's, um, it's interesting. It's got lots of stuff in it. It's old. So like a lot of the supplies, the techniques, like they're not sort of on trend or anything, but I, I don't think that necessarily matters. I mean, I, one of the things I love is that this actually reflects the timelessness of so many art journaling things because I didn't realize for so long that it was from 2015. So I really like that. Um, and I hope that you will join me for the next book club. We're skipping month, so we're not gonna have book club in September. We will have it in October. And as always, I hope that you will take a class. That is what enables me to make great free videos like this. So thank you so much to all of you who have joined my membership program and who also have taken classes and all that kind of good stuff or bought art out of my shop. I appreciate it. Um, as always, if you want to find out sort of what's happening, what opportunities are available, all that kind of stuff, you can sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Um, that comes to your inbox every single Friday. It's really easy and fun to do. Okay. Thanks so much. And I'll see you in October.